A couple of days ago, the Los Angeles Times led with a provocative story titled, Make America California Again. The Times noted that like California, the U.S. will now face a period with one party control of the executive in both houses of the legislature. Well, those of us in California have a long experience with one party rule, and it's not all that it's cracked up to be. That's what we'll talk about today in our independent conversation. I'm Graham Walker coming to you today from the Independent Institute here in Oakland, California, a stone's throw from San Francisco. We're pleased to be partnering today, as usual, with our friends at ThinkSpot.com, and we welcome everybody who's joining us today via that platform and, of course, the many others who also join us. To tackle what one-party rule has meant for California, I'm so pleased to welcome the Independent Institute's Senior Vice President, Mary Thoreau, who is a longtime observer of both California and national policy. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Graham. Pleasure to see you. Pleasure to have you with us and with all of our friends today. Uh, let me just mention regarding our friends who are participating that they can submit their comments um, and questions via uh, the platforms that you're using, especially if you're using thinkspot.com. And those will get to me and we'll try and address your questions as we go along today. So, Mary, it looks like you were reading the minds of the people at the Los Angeles Times. How prescient of me, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, because you, you anticipated... Their point um, last week when you t posted your piece titled uh, California provides a peek at what's ahead for the U.S. under one party rule. Here's a just a quick view of it for our friends. This is on independent.org website under the beacon uh, by Mary L.G. Thoreau. California provides a peek at what's ahead for U.S. under one party rule. You were thinking about the same subject they were, but you came to some pretty different conclusions. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the L.A. Times says that uh, quote, California is emerging as the de facto policy think tank of the Biden-Harris administration and a Congress soon to be under Democratic control. Uh, and then another part of the same article says uh, there is no place the incoming administration is lean leaning on more heavily for inspiration in setting a progressive policy agenda than California. And it seems like you're in good company, Mary, right? At the L.A. Times. And hey, here's Michael Moore. He did a podcast called Make America California Again. But it seems like um, you are not quite as optimistic as they are. Yeah, it's just completely puzzling because Californians are leaving the state in droves because of the problems here. Um, and I reviewed many of them, and I'm going to get to specifics in a minute. But I, before we get going, I also want to say that we are nonpartisan on this issue. We don't think one party under Republicans does the country any favors either. Um, as we saw at the turn of the 21st century when the Republicans held the presidency and the Congress and unfortunately passed massive new powers for the government, which I think would not have been passed had government divided at that time. So we don't want one party to rule us either way. I don't care if it's Republicans or Democrats. It's just a bad idea not to have opposing ideas and That's have right. to have to compete for what's the better solution. We got a comment from one of our participants already on the subject. Uh, one of our friends named Tony writes in saying, what are the advantages of living in a one-party state for the citizens of California? So Mary and I have been scratching our heads thinking, um, are there any advantages? I mean, the only advantage is like you can ram through your policy right away without anybody raising a question, which is why you, you raised the op occasion in reverse. Which isn't an advantage to the citizens, it's just an yeah. advantage to the to the right. politicians and it, it it leaves the citizens uh, up the creek, so to speak. Yeah. So uh, yeah, here in California we've seen the results of one party rule for many, many years now. We have a supermajority mm -hmm. um, in the state legislature and uh, legislature and we've had a government uh, Democrat governor forever. Um, and by every measure, the quality of life has gone down here. Um, it's one of the most unequal states in the country. Mm -hmm. We don't have a middle class per se. It's mostly very rich people and poor people because right. of the policies Tragic. that have that have uh, created that divide. Um, and I'd be happy to to get into specifics on that. Yeah, let's you know just to jump into um, a climate policy. I mean, so. Uh, According to the LA Times and others, uh, Joe Biden has been pushing to nationalize California's effort on climate action, and he calls it pioneering here in California. So what's pioneering about California's green energy policy? I mean, are we like, 
uh, are we ahead of the curve here in California on climate and green energy? Are we like leading the way into a brave future where everything is green or how's that working out here? Well, we're radicals on policy. I mean, it was mandated that uh, we be 100% renewable by 2045 and we're ahead of schedule. The utilities are ahead of schedule on that. Um, it's, it's not, <laughs> It's not ahead of the game in terms of quality of the environment. Um, the environment has been badly degraded, both by California policy and federal policy. Uh, we did this book called Nature Unbound, which looks at uh, federal land policy. Oh yeah, you see it there over your right shoulder. And here in California, we have uh, a majority of the land is under management of the state and the feds. And their environmentally friendly uh, land management policies is they don't manage it. So right. rather than having uh, for, uh, responsible forestry, uh, timber harvesting, and other things, they've just let things grow. It's not nature taking its course because they also put out naturally occurring small fires that would have that helped thin historically forests and so on. And the result is we have tinder boxes. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of our fellows, Lawrence McQuillan, who did a, a golden fleece couple of years ago on wildfires here, for example, showed that in the 1800s, we had an average of 50 trees per acre, and today it's over 500 trees per acre. So those trees are all competing for water and sunlight, and they're more diseased than they would be if they weren't so crowded, which means they die and they're dead. And so we have a tinder box on these public lands that just fuels massively increasing wildfires. So a study, uh, just last week, a study came out from Stanford showing that wildfire smoke has wiped out all the gains in the Western states from the Clean Air Act. Oh, man. Um, now, the politicians get to dodge that because they're not, wildfire smoke is not included in the counts that they get to measure their progress against. Right. Their emissions reductions. So, so meanwhile, green policy leads to forest conditions that are far more vulnerable to fire, which therefore pollutes the atmosphere far worse than it otherwise would have been, but all in the name of a green policy. That's California's policy on green energy. Well, there's more to it. Right, and then people get away with the narrative that these fires are caused by climate change, but it's not climate change, it's bad management. And furthermore, the bad management fuels so-called climate change because 500 trees per acre right. drink up lots of water, including the Sierra snow melt that the Bay Area depends on, so we get drought, mm -hmm. right? It feeds drought, so then we're drier, so then the forests get on fire, so then we have this horrible smoke. And there were days this fall that it was dark. It was literally dark in San Francisco at noon. Yeah, it, it was a, orangey every, black darkness. Everybody called it a you know it was apocalyptic, and it was apocalyptic. It was scary, and it's really bad for your health. Uh, they report massive increases in people having uh, breathing problems, lung problems. So it's killing people with bad quality. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, this is not a recipe for a nice, clean environment. It's a recipe for a, for a very dirty, dangerous environment. And yet it's sold as a recipe for a clean environment. That's its great appeal. I mean, you care about the forest, so you don't want them to be cut down. You care about uh, various kinds of wildlife, so you want to protect them. And yet there's all these paradoxical, unintended effects. And we're seeing them here in California, and there's little resistance to these policies precisely because all the elements of state government are in the hands of one party. So internal critique uh, is much more muted than it would be if we had a competitive party system in California. Exactly, yeah. So what's this thing? I hear that, um, that Joe Biden has also said that he wants the national grid to go to zero emissions by 2035, is it? That's not very far from now. Yeah, so first of all, it's unachievable. So in, uh -huh. San, in California, again, uh, the utilities are ahead of schedule for, for going all renewable. Right. But the problem is uh, you can't produce enough electricity using all renewable sources to meet demand. Right. So we not only got blackouts as fire safety measures, we got blackouts because this summer when it got hot, 
and people wanted to, you know, wanted something like uh, called air conditioning. Or sometimes air purifiers to get rid of the or smoke. Or air purifiers <laughs> because of the smoke yeah. and so on. Um, the grid couldn't handle it, and four million Californians were cut off of power for days on end. Um, and this happens everywhere. Germany famously is green, right? Uh, all solar, but they don't get enough sunlight to run it, so they actually are firing a lot of coal there. Um, and that never gets attention, but green is not enough to run it. And in California, we can't even we can't even service the demand we have now. And yet Newsom has proposed banning or has said gas-fired cars are going to be uh, illegal after 2035. So then what happens to the grid when we have all oh, electric cars? Even more electricity, hmm. none of which can be produced uh, after we're zero emissions by anything other than solar and wind and hydroelectric. And then the other trade-off we've seen with all of this investment in solar and wind in California is means all the, the money is going to that and the money is not going to maintaining the towers that run the electrical lines. So for example, uh, Northern California's utility, pg e its towers average 70 years, and the tower that started the big fire in 2018 was 100 years old. So they're not maintained, so they're not safe, so they spark wildfires. Uh, meanwhile, they, they're not investing in things that would make us safer, such as undergrounding wires, right. mm -hmm. or uh, creating microgrids so we, they could they could target where blackouts mm -hmm, are. Mm -hmm. So the result is that even where where I live, uh, our power lines are underground, but since we're all one big grid, we still get blacked out because everybody has to be blacked mm -hmm. out. I think you said in your piece, uh, Mary, that's on the independent.org blog, The Beacon, that Californians bear the highest utility costs in the country. I think you said 40% uh, above the national average. 40% above the national average and double Oregon and Washington, which doesn't make any sense. So this will this greening thing is going to, again, hit the poorest very hard. Um, in California also, it's resulted in nutty things like we now have solar panel mandates on new housing, so uh, housing right. gets more mm -hmm. expensive. All of these things hurt the poor. Electric cars are very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things hit the poor and make the poor poor. Mm -hmm. Um, and make the rich richer, and you're going to see the great divide that California has between the rich and the poor extend in a wave across the country, and people are not going to enjoy it. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's really problematic. And again, just to kind of repeat the, the refrain that's common here, uh, these policy decisions um, are able to be implemented um, pretty readily, and opposition is muted because one party controls uh, both houses of our legislature and the executive for a very long time. Yeah, there's no debate, and we have a bigger problem now with this cancel culture. So, for example, since the narrative that drives this green stuff um, is climate change, and the narrative that that they excuse wildfires, they excuse themselves from any culpability for wildfires is, oh, well, the wildfires are caused by climate change and so on. But you're now not allowed to question climate change. Oh, right, right. That reinforces. They're canceling critics of it. Um, and so on. So it's going to be really bad news. And as Glenn Greenwald points out, they're coming in with huge new restrictions on speech and other things that's going to make the, the war on terror look like, you know, the first act of a terrible play. Yeah, you mentioned that at the beginning, that you were criticizing the Republicans back then in 2000 and following uh, when they, or 2001 and following, when they had the uh, kind of consolidated power for a while and passed all the um, War on Terror and the Patriot Act and so forth. Um, if, in fact, uh, the climate crisis is as great as many seem to advocate, and if it requires wartime footing, then wartime footing always carries along with it the likelihood, the possibility, the incentive for constriction of freedom of speech, just like it did during the war under uh, Bush II. Yeah, because if these ideas are, are too dangerous, they're existentially dangerous, they cannot be heard. And the thing about all these climate change studies is they haven't been repli they can't be replicated. They're models that are that are based on you know narrative, not reality. Uh, so there's not a, you have to have a debate to truth comes from debate. Right, exactly. Not from just repeating 
this is true, this is true, this is true, over and over again. Um, you mentioned a little bit ago that some of these policies have an especially high impact upon poorer Californians. This is a pretty interesting point, because most of the policies in the progressive agenda uh, of the one-party state here in California are often sold on the basis of they're better to help the less, least advantaged. Um, but in your piece uh, that you put uh, in your blog, you mentioned about taxation. California has some of the highest and most regressive taxes in the country on income, which supposedly hits the wealthier harder. But then you mentioned all those other taxes. This is the California model. Tell us about the California model with regard to other kinds of taxation and how it helps or hurts the poor. Well, we literally nickel and dime the poor to death. Um, we have very high sales taxes, which impacts them a great deal. Mm -hmm. We have very high sin taxes, and we have them on a whole range of things, not just tobacco and alcohol, but vaping and even you know soda pop, Coca-Cola. Um, and study after study shows that so-called sin taxes are the most regressive that there are, which means they disproportionately fall on the poor. How about gas tax? We have the highest gas tax in the country, which makes our gasoline 50% more expensive than any place else in the country. And that hits the poor harder because they have to live farther away from where they work because housing is so expensive. <laughs> right. And housing is so expensive because of the regulations against building new housing, including we have this wonderful uh, environmental act that any proposed new housing can be challenged on the basis of environmental impact. Well, guess what? Things like a child being added to the school is an environmental impact, um, for example. Mm -hmm. So, but it goes worse than that because anybody can bring a challenge under, it's called CEQA mm -hmm. for California Environmental, Environmental Quality yeah. Act. Mm -hmm. uh, but anybody can challenge any development, even anonymously. And it's being used to extort money from developers. It's being used to extort uh, union concessions, it's being used just because, for obviously, NIMBYism, not in my backyardism. Uh, so you cannot, you literally can't build new housing in California, on top of which the do-gooders destroyed cheap housing because, of course, it wasn't, it wasn't very nice. Mm -hmm. You don't want people living in housing that's not very nice. So they wrecked it under uh, urban renewal, like the Fillmore uh, neighborhood in San Francisco, which was a thriving black neighborhood with enter businesses and families and homes. What, did they bulldoze it? They bulldozed it, mm. literally bulldozed mm -hmm. it. And they shut, they, they bulldozed thousands of single room occupancy hotels. And they, you know, promised they were going to build these utopian new cities, which never came about. So the net result was they destroyed housing that people actually could afford. And viable and neighborhoods. Only, and now only the government can build affordable housing, except it's not affordable. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a huge problem with a huge gap at the, currently 2 million units short of housing in, in California. And when you have that kind of shortage, the only thing that can happen is you get either uh, you get uh, restrictions on it, so rationing of housing, which happens, mm -hmm. or prices go through the roof. Mm -hmm. And if prices don't go through the roof, then you get the ration. It seems that in California, uh, the kind of residential construction that can be successfully um, undertaken at a profit is kind of at the high end because you have to get a lot of money for the, the construction in order to pay all the costs that are loaded on to you in California through the zoning, through the environmental quality, through the so so solar mandates and so forth. It seems to me that in California, the bottom rungs of the housing ladder have been kicked out in the name of the public good, I guess, but that means that people at the bottom can't get their foot on the bottom rung because there's no bottom rung. Right. And so they end up on the streets. Yeah, or leaving. Yeah, or but leaving. Of course, the poor also have a harder time moving. Yeah, they can't get out. Um, the people who are, who are exiting California, and it's massive, I, mean, I think 90,000 households this year left California for places like Texas and Nevada and Florida. Um, a young tech friend of mine says he's the only one of his friends who's still here. Wow. So those are the people who are leaving. It's the people who have the money to you know, pack up and go, uh, leaving fewer high, in, high earners to tax 
and more poor people here who need help. Yeah, one of the high earners, I so guess. It's, a, is, it's just a, it's a spiral. It, it is a spiral, yeah. I mean, I guess Elon Musk is moving to Texas, is that right? He may be. Uh, he's been he's been quite good on this whole cancel culture stuff, saying you're not going to enjoy it when the few tech titan titans are in charge of what you can read. Yeah, so. and it was kind of stunning, I think, that one of our uh, 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 legislative leaders in Sacramento, Lorena Gonzalez, um, gave him a kind of nasty goodbye greeting uh, recently, uh, and I think his response was uh, "message received." <laughs> yeah. So about those who can't get away, though, I mean. You mentioned in your blog post, for example, uh, that California is now full of cities that are becoming really unlivable, um, thousands right. of people in the streets. Um, and so I'm just quoting you here, you can uh, elaborate, but you said, rather than providing recovery services or pathways to helping them achieve their full potentials, billions of taxpayer dollars are directed to stasis. What did you yeah. mean by that, Mary? As is, mm -hmm. uh, so we're do so in San Francisco. There are two sort of policies that ho official homelessness policies that come from the, come from the feds, but are kind of doubled down on here in California. Um, housing first, which kind of is very simplistic thinking that if you get somebody housed, they're no longer homeless. Mm. If only it were that simple. Right. So it's supposed to be that people go into housing and then. Once they're in housing, they can access services. The way it actually works in practice is you put people in housing with no requirements. So there's no requirement not to use drugs or alcohol. There's no requirement to try to find work. So it's a, they're essentially warehouses uh, where you put somebody in there and you don't help them and they remain addicted. You do not address their underlying causes, what are, the trauma that made them homeless in the first place. Um, and they're incredibly expensive. So they, upshot is that as the government has has fed more and more resources into housing first homelessness has gone up and it outpaces it and we're coming out with a new policy study on uh, homeless policy home, housing and homeless policies and it shows that you could devote literally an infinite number of dollars into housing first and you would not ever end homelessness because more people enter homelessness than exit via housing first, no matter how much money you put into it. Mm -hmm. um, the other policy that's, that's national and local policy is called harm reduction. And the theory of harm reduction is you make it less dangerous to use drugs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's needle exchanges, right. mm -hmm. um, things like that, so that people who are using drugs don't die of overdoses. Mm -hmm. In practice, how it's carried out is it's, it's, it's perpetuating drug use. They're delivering drug paraphernalia. They're even delivering how to how to smoke fentanyl brochures. Wow, at public expense. At public expense. So you're 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 enabling addiction. You're enabling street living, and you're keeping people from seeking out the help that they need. And the, again, so uh, there were some people in HUD and uh, the United States Center on on uh, on homelessness. In the Trump administration, who uh, actually there were some good studies coming out, which uh, echo some of our findings that these are these policies have pres have resulted in their opposite intent. But Biden has come out publicly saying he's all in for housing first. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to see homelessness continue to rise because that's what housing first does. So to be clear, <clears throat> for those who feel that they are attracted to the California model, the California model on these matters is dramatic restrictions on residential construction in the name of various good things, but that dramatically reduces housing availability. The implementation of policies regarding the homeless, which actually carefully avoid offering any judgment uh, on self-harm practices, but rather facilitating such practices. Um, and so they can't find a place to live on their own. You bulldoze the bad neighborhoods and replace them with, well, some kind of government constructed thing. That combination looks like a toxic model for increase of homelessness. Absolutely, and it's not a matter of judgment. It's a matter of, I mean, it's not compassionate to leave somebody living on the street, as Dr. Drew Pinsky has pointed out. That's a death sentence to people. People who live on the street die. Mm -hmm. uh, people who go in, and I talked to a San Francisco police captain who calls these housing first facilities as places where the homeless go to die more slowly. Mm. So this is not, 
proposing alternative approaches is recognizing that these are human beings who deserve a chance to achieve their full potentials and offering them help to achieve, to set goals and meet them so that they can meet their full potentials. And that's what liberals claim they care about right. people, but their policies hurt people. Mm -hmm. yeah, especially those policies then coupled with the other policies which constrict housing so dramatically really have a kind of a double whammy effect on uh, people in the worst conditions of life. It's uh, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, don't go there. <laughs> don't go there, President Biden. Yeah. Danger, danger. <laughs> exactly. Like we're, we're trying to flash the, flash the warning. Please, please look. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is not what you want. <laughs> so uh, let's move on to um, employment. Uh, let's talk about workers' rights a little bit. Um, now, California passed a few years ago a piece of legislation called AB5, which made independent contracting virtually illegal. Um, it was supposed to protect uh, Uber and Lyft drivers, but really it, it impacted millions of Californians. Uh, I mean, journalists, photojournalists, DoorDash, nurses, anesthetists, and so forth, um, nurse anesthetists, stunning amount of uh, restriction on independent contracting activity. Um, all that has been endorsed by uh, incoming President Joe Biden because he wants to extend to the nation uh, the so-called protections of California's AB5. What will that do, Mary, for employment and workers' rights? Well, and the timing was especially bad to be this year mm -hmm. in the midst of COVID when so many people were out of work and had to get, you know, start l working for themselves through something like that. And this made it illegal to work for yourself. And then the other thing is so many people who were sheltering in place have become dependent on delivery and to make delivery illegal is not a very helpful thing either. Um, it impacted two million American, two million Californians, and if it went nationally, we estimated it'd impact 57 million Americans. Uh, it cuts off, again, it cuts off enterprise. It's just a salve to the unions, and that's who's behind uh, enacting these things. Union leaders have hailed Biden as going to be producing a great, you know, new, great new day for unions in America. Um, but it shuts off, again, that shuts off opportunities for the people at the bottom, especially, who are trying to get a foot onto the economic ladder. Um, we already have bad minimum wage that blocks them. In California, we have high, higher minimum wages than the country. Right. We have licensing laws here that are more restrictive than almost anywhere that block access to many, many professions. And then this AB5 blocked access to even more opportunities. So it's a very, it's an anti-human, pro-union mm -hmm. um, idea. And that's what and that's what happened. It helps. It helps unions. It helps those people who are able to get privileged and and get the protections against competition. Right. But it hurts those people who would like to have a better life and would like to work, um, and are being blocked from being able to work. I remember doing a little research a, a few months ago, uh, indicating that some of the initial sponsors of AB five in uh, the democratically controlled legislature said openly that it was, its purpose was to foster union organi uh, unionization union organization within major companies and that it was a great opportunity to improve the state of unions in the state of California. Yeah, and of course, Uber and Lyft have you know, really undermined the taxis and the taxi unions, which uh, are not happy about it at all. So it's, it's it, you know, but we individuals have benefited enormously from having access to these wonderful new services oh, at, yeah. at far lower cost, far greater convenience, far more pleasant yeah, absolutely. cars than, and uh, the last time I was in a San Francisco yellow cab, it was a scary experience, I'll tell you. Right, and not only that, but all the opportunities for in earning income and all sorts of you know unregulated ways have been just a blossoming of opportunity. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, the unions in California would like to constrict that. And then, of course, for everyone to raise the minimum wage, of course, means that those who are entering the job market won't have jobs, or those yeah. whose skills are lower won't have jobs, which means they'll be more dependent upon public assistance. Uh, yeah. And all of this happens, again, in California because there's a consolidation of power. Um, let's talk for a few more minutes, um, and then I'm going to take a few audience questions here. But 
Let's talk a few more minutes about um, education in California. Oh. I mean, Ed, yeah. don't, don't, don't we uh, spend the highest per capita of any state in the union on public education? According to our fellows, yes. And we rank at the bottom of, in the public schools. Yeah. Public school students rank at the bottom of uh, proficiency scores in math, reading, and science. And this is supposed to be, you know, the home of STEM. Right. And we only have 40% of eighth graders uh, testing proficient. So it's not, it's not building the future workforce that we need. Meanwhile, California's educational curriculum is very heavy on uh, sex ed. Mm -hmm. It's very heavy on gender education, right. teaching children that gender is a choice mm -hmm. and fluid and, and encouraging uh, gender experimentation, sexual in, in, uh, experimentation as well. And now this whole uh, identity politics, this anti-capitalist ethnic studies curriculum that's now been defeated twice, last year and this year, in large part, not to tat our own horn, but it deserves to be, in large part because of the efforts of our senior fellow, Bill Evers. Um, but it's, you know, it, it, it's not dead yet. And it's teaching people that capitalism is racist. It's teaching people that so-called people of color um, are victims. It doesn't tout uh, people of color who have been heroic. It just uh, showcases the victimization. And then it, it characterizes Jews, Irish, Italian, and other populations that faced enormous uh, racism or, oh, or yeah. discrimination, uh, discrimination mm -hmm. when they came here. But it now touts them as having white racial privilege. So it's just, it's nonsense, uh, and, it, and that's what they're teaching, but they're not teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. Right, and it's a little ironic that in the home of the, you know, the greatest technical innovation probably in the world, or what has been, our educational system now is focusing not on the kind of skills that it will enable people to thrive and create, but to give them a kind of progressive mindset on all the politically correct issues of the day. This is bound to have a long-term stultifying impact on, uh, well, culture, but then on economic prospects for those least advantaged because they're going to be taught ideology rather than taught skills. Right, and that's not what we, that's not what we need to meet these challenge. That you know, we we do have serious challenges in the twenty first century. Absolutely, and it is going to take people who can think, and reason, and study, and decide, and experiment. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, scientifically experiment, mm -hmm. not <laughs> not model, right? <laughs> um, to solve them, and we're not educating people to be able to do so. One of the funny things about the California model, just you know, stepping back a little bit from it, is that uh, uh, the consolidation of power and policy in Sacramento um, has had all the you know regrettable effects, many of them unintended, but regrettable n that we've been talking about. Um, sometimes Californians see that. So, for example, um, you mentioned the ethnic studies curriculum, which uh, our uh, center director, Bill Evers, was calling the, blowing the whistle on. Ultimately, between his efforts and that of many other uh, ethnic communities in California, uh, did persuade Governor Newsom to veto the originally mandated curriculum. Now, it's, it's going re to pop back up in some new form, again, because all the power and all the bureaucracy is all held by one, one party in Sacramento. So it's gonna come back. But Governor Newsom did, did veto that because people realized, hey, we don't wanna to be told that we're all horrible racists just because we happen to be East Asian or whatever. We don't wanna to be told all that. So um, there is resistance. And then again, you know, uh, all the leaders in California uh, endorsed, uh, well, excuse me, opposed uh, Proposition 22 on our ballot recently, which restored, at least to some of the industries, uh, the freedom to independent contracting. And even Joe Biden, he opposed Proposition 22. And he's threatening to, to reverse the will of the California voters mm -hmm. who overturned, you know, who passed that and overturned portions of AB5. So, you know, he that's not very democratic of him. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of stunning, really. Uh, what You wonder what California voters are thinking. They're, they're voting for all the people who insist upon restricting independent contracting, and then they vote to liberate independent contracting 
literally against the explicit advice of their Democratic Party leaders, both nationally and at the state level. Um, Californians are a little per perplexing that way, but it does show that they notice the facts on the ground, even though they tend to vote for one party. Yeah, the problem with you know voting for candidates is any candidate carries a kind of a basket of, yeah, right. of policies, and so you can't really, it's very difficult to align candidate policy mm -hmm. on a one-to-one -one basis. But when, when one party controls everything and policy gets consolidated and some of the bad effects become increasingly visible, people do start waking up. There does tend to trigger a backlash. So people are you know, they're asking us, basically, if California has experienced this consolidated one-party rule for so many years here, what has happened by way of rec recourse, response, reaction, and could that happen on a national level? Could the National Democratic Party, controlling the White House and both branch houses of Congress, could they end up triggering some of these similar reactions. And it's possible, look, for example, I'll give you one. I mean, uh, California has had some of the most restrictive and sometimes unpredictable pandemic lockdown policies. Um, I thought at first that maybe we were gonna get some good results out of it, even though I regretted the policies, but it turns out that even though we've had, uh, among the most restrictive lockdowns, we've had the greatest surges now in, in virus. So. That's mm -hmm. triggering um, a questioning of Governor Newsom's judgment, which has led to a recall effort. What do you think is going to happen with that, Mary? It's a very strong recall effort, and it's not just the you know his dictatorship under COVID and his his extremely hypocritical dictatorship under COVID. You know he he imposes very restrictive stay-at-home orders on us, and yet he's going you know famously to dinners at a 300 plus dollar plate uh, restaurant. Right. Everyone in Napa. knows the French laundry all over the world now. Right. The French laundry in Napa. And the San Francisco mayor went to dinner there the, the next night it turns out. So and then of course Nancy Pelosi has also been very famously hypocritical about this, you know. So restrictions for thee but not for me. Uh, but you know other things new some these wildfires even though he tries to dodge them under climate change and so on people Many people recognize that he bears uh, culpability in these things and in, and in other um, areas. So it is a very real recall effort, and I, I hope it does succeed because he needs to be made an example of, and people need to, you know, our rulers need to be afraid of the people, um, and a recall is a great way to, to remind them, you know, for whom they ostensibly work. Uh, California is also unique in that we do have the proposition system where mm -hmm. You know, we can we can have a ballot initiative that comes from literally the grassroots, and we can vote directly right. on things, which is what happened to overturn parts of this AB five um, that we had a proposition to do it. Right. And so, and that's how, of course, we also got tax relief under Prop thirteen years ago, famously, because right. the politicians are never going to, you know voluntarily cut our taxes. They're never going to reverse themselves on, you know, legislation that unions like and so on. So we need, you know, if we're going to have one party rule nationally, uh, hopefully it's not going to get locked in. And I would guess the midterm elections are going to see a correction because once people see what's what's up. But who knows how draconian right. it can get right. in the immediate term because they're really talking about serious. In addition to the things we've talked about, that would be this environmental policy nationally would be disastrous. It would impoverish us. Uh, the you know the things we've already talked about are, are already bad enough. But now you add on to it, they're turning this this capital incident into an excuse to uh, you know censor us and 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 impose rules and get people fired from their jobs and and canceled and so on is very 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 dangerous. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, there's a kind of a lesson to be learned across these examples. Wherever power is consolidated, whether it be in a state government or whether it now be in the consolidated high-tech social media world, um, there's the temptation for abuse. There's the temptation for restricting uh, resistance. The more power yeah. you have, the, the less you seem to be able to tolerate dissent. Um, and when those things seem to be m more evident, I, I do feel that both Californians and Americans more generally may well realize that, hey, we need to step back. We need to think. We need to pause. We need to maybe 
put a little bit of, um, you know, uh, divided power back into place. In California, uh, because the, the one party has such a long track record here, it's tough to do it, which is why propositions are so important. Propositions provide in California what multi-party rule might do elsewhere. Uh, it's the one venue. And then, of course, uh, Californians can also do recalls, as some other states can do, too. But you need some mechanisms for correcting, for tempering. And I wouldn't be surprised if two years from now, uh, both in California and nationally, we saw some turn back on policy. I'm not talking about going back to previous political leaders. I'm talking about turning back on different policies, which um, have the downsides we've been talking about. Yeah, as you point out, we need divided government to slow things down because otherwise they'll just go full speed ahead and that, that does not help us. Here's an interesting question from one of our uh, participants. And let me remind you, if you're with us today via ThinkSpot or our other platforms, that you can pop in some questions and they'll probably get to the, most of them are getting to me here. Um, here's someone who says, would you describe the structure of California politics as, as an oligopoly? It seems that a few intertwined families the Gettys, the Browns, and the Pelosi's have dominated the landscape for the last 60 plus years, but no one talks about this. That's an interesting angle. I don't know enough about it. I think there is, in fact, some connection among those families and between the Pelosi family and the Newsom family. Am I right about that? Do you know the details, Mary? Yeah, Newsom is, is Nancy Pelosi's nephew, yeah, I believe. Yeah, I think that's what it and is. And then they're all very, they're very um, um, financially backed by the Getty family. So, of course, Pelosi doesn't need backing. She's one of the richest women in the country um, and Newsom now as well. So it's an interesting question. We do Brown, of course, you had the Brown family dynasty mm -hmm. in, in the governorship and so on. Uh, I I wouldn't term California as an oligopoly, but it's there's strong, certainly, yeah. you know, there's obviously people scratching each other's backs. Here's another question. What happened to the other and older California tradition of uh, preference for free markets? After all, wasn't this also the state of Ronald Reagan? Yeah, and there are plenty of, you know, there are plenty of Californians who, who are still firmly wedded to free markets and free ideas and so on. Uh, so we need to learn to be very good spokespeople for those ideas and not let ourselves get drowned out by uh, this false narrative. Um, there are plenty of people. Uh, we at Independent, when we hold it, when we could hold live events and so on, would get lots of people coming and they'd be very surprised to see the kinds of numbers that we attract to hear some different ideas than usually mm -hmm. get aired in the in the mainstream media, um, and everywhere I go, and I, I you know, I, I talk places, and you know, back in the olden days, socialize and so on, and people become aware of what we do and so on. And, oh wow, you know, I had no idea. So there's there are a lot of people they just uh, feel as if they don't have a voice because they don't have a political voice mm -hmm. and. It's hard to have a voice in the media because the media similarly has been kind of playing from one page. And if they're going to drown out alternative uh, sites and shut down people's uh, uh, accounts, I mean, do we really want nobody on Twitter with different ideas? If you have those kinds of ideas, go over there to go to that backroom parlor. You know, don't we want to be in the same room talking to each other? That's mm -hmm. the kind of idea behind things like living room conversations and others. Is we need to be, we need to be talking together, exchanging different ideas, right. and not just reinforcing echo chambers. Yeah. For example, I mean, I think it's really quite a privilege for us here at the Independent Institute to be right here in the midst of the San Francisco Silicon Valley area with a voice uh, that's quite independent, we're nonconformists. This is good, we need more of this in California. So I'd, t I'd say to Californians who are discouraged by the uh, fallout from one party rule in California, don't go, <laughs> stay, and you know, pay attention, talk, gather with others. Um, uh, I think it's premature to abandon California. California's got too much going for it. No, and we have no intention to, you know, again, we, there, California is a wonderful place uh, geographically. The people here are wonderful. They don't deserve to be victimized by bad policies, and the people of the United States don't deserve to be victimized by bad policies either. So we're hoping uh, to make it known that 
progressives who claim they're here to help you are not. Right. Uh, we can we can let us be a warning to the rest of the country mm -hmm. and let us help free the very good people of this state and this country to be the best that we can be, uh, to be good neighbors and friendly to one another and not divide. I mean, government loves to divide and conquer and let's not let them play that game with us. We have more in common than we than we haven't. Exactly, we really do. Um, and uh, here, here's a late breaking question that's on some detail, but this is interesting. Um, uh, what about the scandal with the Employment Development Division? Um, why didn't they handle the uh, funds correctly? Do you know anything about that, Mary? Well, we just did a, we, we award this Golden Fleece Award to waste, fraud, and neglect um, of agencies in California. And we just did one on um, called Bugs in the System. The terrible, here we are, in, again, as you mentioned, uh, Sacramento is 90 miles from Silicon Valley, and yet technology in Sacramento is antiquated mm -hmm. and doesn't work. So this year, the EDD, it's now estimated that it's $8 billion worth of fraudulent claims. They've been sending money to murders, convicted murders in prison, to millionaires and billionaires, uh, and, and it's gotten so bad now that the EDD now has suspended all payments on thousands of accounts. And so you've got innocent people who the government, we've done work and we've shown how mutual aid societies traditionally have been very helpful to people suffering setbacks in their lives. Mm -hmm. But the welfare state, of course, has crowded those out and now and it's made people in reduced circumstances dependent upon the welfare state, and now they've closed down the welfare state. So the destitute, you know, the people who were depending on, on unemployment now have nothing. And I mean, they're getting desperate. So they, they tell people, well, we need eight weeks to investigate, you know, whether or not your account is has been compromised or not, and meanwhile, you're not getting any money. Well, I don't know about the people in Sacramento who can go without any income for eight weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but the poor mother in Reading, who's got children to support and has been told that the government will take care of her and now is being told that, ah, you know, we're sorry, we've got a little problem here. Bear with us while we while we sort it out. That's, that's tragic. And again, because of the one party situation, there's little accountability. I'm just gonna, point out and show folks uh, that we have this uh, available on our website, independent.org. This is one of our California Golden Fleece Awards here, bugs in the system. You can read about the failure of the EDD computer systems and in general how government technology fails here in the home of high tech. Um, yeah. we, we're, we're, on, we're on the watch for this kind of a thing, but we, we would do better if we had more accountability and more competition than we do politically here in California. And again, in each of our, you know, like each of these studies we do, like the wildfire study and this IT study, importantly, all of our studies carry very specific solutions to right. the problem. Mm -hmm. So we're not just here griping and saying, this is terrible. We have, we have very uh, well-researched, well-founded, and uh, real-world solutions to these problems. So we're trying to, trying to be part of the the solution here. We think uh, that California has a great future. So does the United States of America. Uh, one party rule here um, has had some bad consequences because it's been wedded to a progressive ideology uh, that actually does more harm than good. So, you know, if you're looking at California, uh, we're just here to remind you, um, look again. Um, California had an earlier tradition of greater freedom that has more to offer than our current practice of one party rule. Yeah, and this language is just, you know, very, it's straight out of 1984. So progressive actually means regressive. Right, exactly, yeah. right. And, and helping the poor means hurting the poor. Right. <laughs> and tackling homelessness means aggra Creating homelessness. aggravating homelessness, right. The war on drugs means increasing drugs. Right, yeah, right, right. all these things, all, yeah. It's, it's, it's a strange, strange world we live in. Uh, here at the Independent Institute, we're trying to help you all sort these things out. Um, Mary Thoreau, thank you so much for your hard work in pointing out what the California model currently seems to mean and how it can be so much better. Uh, we're grateful for your work.
Well, thank you, Graham, and thanks for everybody who joined us today. And please, again, as the tagline of my piece says, uh, information is the enemy of these things. It's the enemy of what we call Leviathan, big government and crippling government. So the best uh, tool that we have at our hands is to get informed and to learn to articulate uh, good information to our friends and communities and in every forum that we can uh, get our voice heard. Truth will out, we be firmly believe, and uh, that's what we're here to do. We welcome having you join with us on that. We're here to serve. Go to our website, independent.org. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks to our friends at ThinkSpot in particular. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.